We're going to listen to Allie Stroud for a minute. She's in her final semester. Going to perform one more time. So if the people back there who can hear me, help bring those who can't hear me closer. And we will start in just a minute with Miss Allie Stroud. Amen, because we're Southerners and it took us three syllables to 
get out, amen. <laughs> so then the evangelist would humbly walk and start the sermon. It was normally around this point that when I was about eight or nine that the pen and paper came out and I would start playing mash with my friend. Yes. Or in the group, we'd get out our Bibles and look like we were taking notes when really we were just passing notes that said, how much longer is this going to be? <laughs> start at the pulpit, get excited and pace the stage, go back to the pulpit, beat on it, emphasizing that we were all going to hell with a drink or smoke, and if it was pizza night, he'd look right at the youth group and go on and condemn those who were even hinting at doing either of the aforementioned. Those poor heathen Presbyterians and Methodists probably wanted to get up and leave right then and there because we all knew they were allowed to drink wine. The sermon usually lasted 45 minutes to an hour. Then it would usually end with some sad tale of woe of a guy who was an alcoholic and got into a car accident and died and didn't know Jesus. The evangelist never seemed to emphasize any other type of story. It was always an alcoholic. In fact, there was one evangelist who had a book on his display table, a pen standing next to a headstone, and the title of the book was, and this is not a joke, All My Friends Are Dead. Come to find out, not Come to find out, the evangelist used to be an alcoholic and all of his friends had died because of alcohol. This was why I grew up thinking that if I ever thought about touching beer, my salvation would be taken away and I'd end up going to hell. After the tale of, of alcoholism and how it would kill you, the evangelist would get very quiet. Then he would say, I want every head bowed and every eye closed. No peeking. This was so hard for me to do. What kid doesn't want to peek when you tell them not to? He went on. Are you going to be like Sam, who drank beer and died in a car accident and didn't mm. know Jesus? Mm. Sam's in hell right now. Is mm. that where you want to be? I don't want any movement. Don't leave. Don't go to the bathroom. Sit right where you are. See what I tell you about going to the bathroom? He said that, and immediately I inevitably had to go. But heaven forbid I move, because then God's spirit would be taken away, and it would be my fault that my heathen Methodist and Presbyterian friends didn't get saved. He continued and asked everyone if we knew Jesus, and if we didn't, to raise our hands. The next question was always the rededicate your life question. I admit that I rededicated my life almost every revival, as did most of my church friends. If you sit in a three-hour service like that and are told because you don't read your Bible and don't witness to your friends, you're either not saved or you need to get serious again with God long enough, you're going to either think that you're, you're not saved or you really need to get serious again with God. The piano music swelled at this point and got louder, and then we all joined in the hymn, Just As I Am. I always prayed, please let someone come up so we can go home. I don't know if that's terrible or not. What I do think is terrible is that I felt like the evangelist guy was basically pressuring people and saying, if they didn't come up now, then they would be, then they would be headed for hell. So he was really scaring them into inviting Jesus into their hearts. My reformed self kind of chuckles at this now. We don't invite Jesus, he invites us. Please don't debate me on that. I don't debate, please thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the evangelist would then say, we're not leaving until everyone has made that decision. I couldn't leave here tonight knowing that there is not one person who has come down the aisle. That's another thing about being raised Southern Baptist. I started to think if you didn't come down the aisle during the invitation that you would never accept a Jesus. In fact, as a teenager, my friends and I wouldn't talk about when we got saved. We'd talk about when we came down the aisle. It was during the point of, we're not leaving, I started to get a tad annoyed. It was at least 8.30 or 9 by now, and if it was a Wednesday, that meant my brother and I had been on church property since 8.30 a.m. that morning. I knew there were often times I wanted to say aloud, uh, no one else is coming, can we go home now? <laughs> but another round of Just As I Am was played, and even after that, he sometimes would try and guilt another person to walk down the aisle. I hate that it sounds like I'm against evangelists. I think they can be used in great ways. What I'm against is the fact that for the most part, the evangelists I heard growing up only seem to care about how many people they saved, or how many people they got of alcohol, or how many times they could hold an audience for an invitation. I'm sure they were somewhat genuine about it at first. When you're raised thinking that if you don't win enough souls, you're a bad Christian, you can't help but throw, but throw that mentality on other people. I do know one thing. I really wish that my father had started out as a, as a heathen Presbyterian, but then again, God can use anything to bring us where we are today, and for that, I'm truly thankful. Thank you. Woo!